This podcast is called Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest get some secrets off their chest. You should listen. It's the best. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with me, Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm sitting in my home with a great comedian and a big, powerful human being, <laughs> Jeff May. <laughs> that's that's. I'm glad you did that second. <laughs> Yeah, that's like when, whenever a female comic is brought up as being cute or pretty. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there looking at the host being like, what are you doing? Yeah. What's your goal? Do people comment on the fact that you are an actual fit human being a lot when they bring you up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And sometimes it's a very contentious bring up where they're like, this ne- like a lot of bar shows I'll get a, and they'll be like, this next guy can beat up the whole uh, bar. Let's give it up for <laughs> Jeff May. I'm like, hey, you're on my side, right? Like, yeah. I do get that a lot. Like. I don't get why. I've been called, uh, sometimes like I've hosted shows and like the comic will come up and they'll be like, I didn't know the bouncer was doing comedy here. And I'm like, dude, I am running this open mic and you're (laughs) talking shit on me. Like, what is wrong with you? So does it, obviously it might be annoying from a perspective of like, yeah, we don't always have to comment on people's physical, uh, you know, their physicality. But does it bug you from a different perspective of like, I'm not. I'm not my muscles. <laughs> no, I mean, not really because I grew up the exact opposite. I mean, I was okay. always big, but more like a hard-boiled egg physically. Okay. Uh, and then and then uh, it sort of did the shift over to like, I think when I was 19, I started boxing and like the body shift. Okay. Away. So I had all the torture and nerd buildup of yeah. an adolescent <laughs> to give myself the personality that I have. And then as an adult or as an emerging adult, I yeah. guess. Um, I was just like, all right, now I can, uh, now I'll do the physical thing. Yeah. Uh, and try to like sort of renaissance myself out a little bit. Nice, nice. And yeah. you have great stuff in your set about being aware that you look like the stereotype of a jock, but in your heart you are the stereotype yeah. of a nerd. Yeah, I've, I deal with that a lot. That's actually, I used to work at a comic shop and I used to be treated like kind of badly by a lot of the nerds that would come in. Oh, because, really? Well, because I just, I remind them, I'm like triggering to people. <laughs> Because, like, when you see me, like, I'm just like a, I'm 6'4", you know, like, I'm big, I'm, I'm wide, uh, I, I wear the hat like a jerk. Like, I'm always wearing this. Like, I look like a jerk. But the hat, yeah, the hat is just, that's what you would do no matter what, right? Yeah, this is, is not any sort of, like, I've made my personal brand and Jeff May's a hat guy. No, there's no, there's no branding in it. It's just, this is who I am. And I... Like back, I used to be a teacher. Full disclosure, I'm a retired teacher. Okay. I retired <laughs> you when got I was too th- old for that shit. Yeah, 30 years old. I was like, I thought I'd be dead by now. So I guess I got to try anything. Um, and I used to wear a suit and tie every day. Okay. And as a teacher, that made sense. When I shifted over to comedy, I tried doing suit and tie yeah. stand up, and it did not fit my act whatsoever, like at all. Yeah. Like I tried. I tried for like a couple months. And I mean, you've seen my act, but I'm very animated and it very nerdy and it doesn't hit when somebody is dressed like they're, you know, going to a wedding or something. Yeah, that's fascinating to me because I've talked about on the podcast before. I did an episode about suits. I love suits. But there's that uh, discussion of like how much baggage do do people have about Mm. them when they see them? And yeah, if you're muscular, look like a jock. Yeah. Then have a suit and are also a nerd. That's just sort of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Three ideas, guy. What's with three ideas? Yeah, you and and so what I I realize is like like who you see me at, like when you see me, I'm always gonna look pretty much the exact same. Yeah, like I'm always wearing the Red Sox hat, some sort of Star Wars or comic booky shirt yeah. uh, and jeans. Like it's what it is. It's actually the same way back when I was single and I'd go on dates. Like this is how I'd show up on date one, just so I could be like, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what you're into. I'm fine with it. Yeah, this is what but you're getting. I'm like, I'm, I, I like, it's like a disclaimer. Yeah. Like, like, I'm always like that. So when I decided to do the shift to comedy, wearing a hat is not often considered a good idea in comedy. Yeah. Um, which is why I wear it backwards when I'm on stage, generally speaking, which I'm not backwards hat guy. But <laughs> you people need to see yeah. your face and your expressions, and a hat doesn't do that. Yeah, um, although I, I do kind of like the idea if you could always get the shadow cast exactly so people couldn't see your eyes. I like the mystery. <laughs> yes. The ninja yes, comic. the Darth comic, yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah. could be, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Where are you people from today? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so I want to get into your obsession. Yeah. Uh, now people people got a good picture of you, of your, your physical appearance and your yeah. soul. Uh, your obsession, I reached out to you and you said Rick and Morty. The so let's go show, with Rick and Morty. Yeah. Rick and Morty. I have these different pockets of obsessions. Yeah. Like there's always something that is like a new obsession within the past couple of years. And then I have these like mid-level obsessions and then I have lifelong obsessions. Okay. Um, and so I gave you three. I gave you one of each. And oh, really? Chose, yeah, I gave you... Uh, Empire Strikes Back, which is my lifelong. I yeah. gave you, uh, you know, Ecstatics, which is my like mid level. Okay, I've been a huge for whatever. And then Rick and Morty is my most recent obsession. Okay, so we which, don't know how long it's going to last yet. No, but it's well, we don't know how long the show's going to last. Yeah, you know, like any animated series, you could be obsessed with The Simpsons for thirty years, or you could be obsessed with your or any series in general. Like, imagine if you were obsessed with Firefly. And yeah. you're just stuck with like a well, one I season of like, know those people. <laughs> yeah, like, well, now what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, guess I'll read these Dark Horse comics. Yeah. Uh, Rick and Morty is, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't want to dive too deep into yeah, it. Yeah, well, let's, let's just go ahead and start with, if no one has ever seen the show before, how would you explain it to people? The best way to describe it, and it's the way that it was sort of conceived, is sort of like a, almost like an R-rated Back to the Future cartoon. Okay. With slight modifications for for both storytelling effect and also to avoid being uh, sued out your ass. Storytelling and legal. The yeah, reason to do yeah. everything in life. Uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, Rick is a is an alcoholic uh, genius. He's the smartest man in the universe. And Morty is the Michael J. Fox, but fourteen years old grandson. Yeah. And they go on adventures. It's it's a it's a quantum mechanics and quantum physics science fiction extravaganza yeah and now morty isn't cool though like uh michael j fox was in back to the future right he's a little bit more neurotic yeah although we never really michael j fox i, I always think back to the future i always saw him be as being like the exact middle of the road like okay. i never saw him as being super cool he had a skateboard. He though. did have a skateboard. That was the eighties, though. Yeah, and, and that was pretty right? pretty cool. Yeah, but we couldn't use them. Well, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, no, he's not. He's he's very he's a very innocuous, almost like a like a nobody. Okay, uh, in in his existence, right? And, so that contrast between like he's going on all these amazing, unbelievable adventures, but he's a nobody. Yeah, but he's just like a, a blank slate the entire time. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, and it's it's um, they they just did a season three episode one premiere. Nice uh, on April first, uh, April Fool's Day, which uh, was the ultimate anti April Fool's prank. Yeah, that they could have done because there's there's a lot there's a lot of math involved. But in the season two uh, final episode, they they basically said we'll see you in like a year and a half or more. Exactly a year and a half to the wow. day it was April first, and that was like a meta on purpose. And then they released it because people have been waiting forever for this show. Yeah. Like people are clamoring for it. That they released it on the one day nobody would believe it's being released. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, what hooked you about the show? Did you were you hooked immediately from the first episode? No, it's actually here's the thing. I'm a comedian, yeah. So I'm broke. And that's important to know because we're Do you gonna, mean uh, financially or emotionally? Financially and emotionally. Okay. Uh, but this is a finance thing. Okay. So I don't have cable. Okay. And like it's not like – and w the life of a comic is generally busy if you actually take it seriously. Right. Like because you probably have your day job. You have to do what it is like, you know, do you do anything to take care of yourself physically? And then it's like the last thing is, is there something I can watch? Yeah. You know, like what can I see on TV or something like that? So for me, I actually didn't start watching Rick and Morty until after season one had wrapped up. And then I uh, I think I got it on Amazon or something like that. But the thing is, because of the culture that I'm in, like the nerd culture, like you're kind of like tied into the zeitgeist enough. Yeah. That, like I already knew about the show and I already had a general understanding there that are, it was amazing. Yeah, there are whispers on the wind. Like, yeah, like I go to enough comic book conventions that you don't not see all the Rick and Morty shirts and mashups yeah. and everything there. Like, I'm not dumb. I see it. I'm just like, I need to watch this show. Like, yeah. it was always on my list, so I finally did. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this, is, this is probably the best thing. But it was yeah. only after one season. I hadn't seen season two yet. And so I was kind of like tempering my expectations. Okay. And then recently, uh, within the past year or so, I got season two and started watching it. And I'm just like, oh, okay. 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 So you are you are a, a nerd. You are on the 
analytical side of nerd, I would say, where you have quick access to facts and figures. Yeah. And you, like you broke down for me, your levels of obsession. Yeah. So for you, when you saw Rick and Morty, you appreciated it, I'm sure, as a comedian. Oh, yeah. You appreciated it as a nerd, that it's nerd mm-hmm. humor on some levels. Did you make a conscious decision to go, I am going to add this to my obsessed list? No, but you... Are you have you watched the show before? I've yeah. watched like three or four okay. episodes. I haven't watched it in order. It's one of those things that when you see something that clicks... Yeah. And you're just like... All right, well, this is it now. This is this is the thing. <laughs> I'm in it now. You know, it's here. Like, I yeah. can't not. Because Rick and Morty, it, it, here's the thing. From a comedic standpoint, it's great. Yeah. From a nerd standpoint, like, the pop culture references are just, you can't avoid them. They're, they're there from, you know, obvious ones. Like, oh, that's clearly a xenomorph. Okay. Or, or like, <laughs> oh, Scary Terry. That's clearly, a, you know, Freddy Krueger or whatever. But they, like, make the jokes about how it looks like. Like... So from a pop culture reference, it's fascinating. From an intellectual standpoint, it's a relatively flawless show. Yeah. Like like the the science behind it is so incredible. And like the 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 way everything ties in and, and sort of like threads itself together and, and all the sort of different ways that they're like it's very big on on quantum physics so you are seeing it as something where like hey if i get into this there's plenty to obsess about yeah like it it opens itself up to like there's so much and it it makes you question like like as you're watching it you're like i don't think these are all the same rick and morty's that we're watching like they don't have to be and they never have to actually dictate whether or not the Rick and Morty that you're seeing in a specific episode are actually the yeah. ones that are the main protagonists of the <laughs> series. There's no guarantee for that. Yeah. Because they always play with time and reality and different uh and different sort of like universes. Yeah. And and dimensions and interdimensional travel. So at any point in time, they could throw you the most insane curveball. And that curveball will then, for the remainder of the series, be always in the back of your head. That will be your new and truth. Yeah. And theirs. And they won't forget it. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, because it does seem like they are uh, really good with creating their, their rules and sticking to them for the most part. I think when you have Dan Harmon mixed with Justin Roiland. Dan Harmon, I, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, one of the co-creators. But uh, Dan Harmon yeah, and Justin Roiland. Th- th- this podcast is on his is connected to Starburns. So yeah. I f- okay, so Starburns. <laughs> so you know, yeah, you know, yeah, I've so, been on his show, yeah, yeah. So you you know you know Dan and his level of thinking things out, intricacy, and yeah, yeah and like he's not going like I know. I know people that, you know, were writers on community and stuff and they're just like, man, he would go take a nap and then show up and just be like, have it figured out. Yeah. Like have everything so that they're seamless, I think is a good word. Yeah. And so when you have somebody like Dan Harmon working with someone creative like Justin Roiland as well, you have this sort of real, almost airtight ability to watch them proceed through it. And it's fascinating. Yeah. Like from a, from, from the standpoint of somebody in creative, I am in awe of what these guys have done. I like the way you're describing this because I think it is a truth of a certain kind of obsession, but I haven't talked about it a lot on the podcast where it's almost like a commitment, like a relationship where you're like, Hey, this uh, show actually has a lot of layers. It's not just surface level. We didn't just get along on yeah. the first date. We're going to get along for years and years, so uh, I can invest in you. Exactly. And the other part about that, too, is like I love it as a consumer, but I also respect it as an entertainer. Yeah. Like and that like to see things like that, it's very, very hard because there's sometimes like, like, let's be honest, as a consumer, I am obsessed with Star Wars. But like sometimes when you look at it from like an entertainment point, you're like, Oh, that was very lazy right there, that thing. Or like, oh, you were just doing Flash Gore? Okay, I get it. Like, you kind of like, but you're like, oh, I love what you did with special effects, and I love what you did here and there and there. But like, with with Rick and Morty, I don't see the seams. Yeah. Which is weird to say when you're when I'm like wearing a Boba Fett shirt, being like, ah, sometimes Star Wars is stupid. Uh, but with, like, I can't, yeah. I don't have any issues. And as a nerd, you look for issues sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say quick Star Wars side tangent that Star Wars is always meant to be a little wobbly I like Star Wars and Doctor Who because from their inception they've been a little off and I think that's a part of their charm but I take your point that this is something that is that could be the Rick and Morty could be the messiest show ever 
because it's time travel. It's all yeah. sorts of dimensions. So the fact that it is not messy is a real tribute yeah. to the quality. Well, what's also funny, though, is that in Rick and Morty, they don't do time travel, even though it's addressed. Hmm. Because of how messy it could be, they do they do uh, they do lateral shifting. Okay, they only do the lateral. But so far, they haven't actually done time travel. The closest okay. thing they've done is flashbacks. Okay, but they won't, and he even has like uh, you'll look. Uh, there's a shelf in his garage because like that's where you know he, he, the garage is like his workshop. Okay, and on the shelf is a box that says time travel stuff. And it's literally <laughs> shelved. They shelved the idea of yeah. time travel. It's in front of your face. Like, think about that on, like, even just a meta level. Yeah. That they have literally shown you that they shelved time travel. Like we're aware of that, and maybe we'll pull it out. Yeah. But for now, but for it's now, back there. It's on the shelf. Okay, so the, the show really has these twin poles of Rick and Morty. Mm-hmm. When you're watching, do you feel more like a Rick, like a damaged alcoholic genius guy, or do you feel more like Morty, like... A pure sort of innocent damaged person <laughs> it's hard i think a lot of times like the point of this show is that you have to exist in the gray okay like it's almost like you can't choose one or the other because one is is sort of that well maybe sort of like the growing the growth of naivete like somebody who starts out like like a morty who starts out relatively naive and innocent yeah. but over time is sort of being corrupted by the real life. I mean, this whole show is an existentialist issue. Okay. Like the whole thing, like, I mean, the, the, the constant themes are like, you know, nobody asked to be born. We're all going to (laughs) die. Let's just enjoy it while we're here. There is no God. I mean, they're really like, so Rick is very nihilistic in that regard. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a nihilist, like doing good things I'm all about. Yeah. And, and Rick sort of, it seems reluctant that he, when he does good things, even though, I'm assuming the, the series arc is that no matter how much he wants to convince himself that he doesn't care about his family, he always will. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, that's... But then again, with Rick and Morty, it could at any point in time be like, <laughs> no, because that's what they do. They set up a trope and then they they basically just f- flip the table over and okay. say, that's not what we're doing. Now, and there's a family story, too, usually with, like, a B story, right? Like, the, the family yeah. that is not Rick and Morty have been getting, uh, growing in prominence in the series. Is that right? Yeah, because they're really fascinating. Because if you, like, and and sort of, like, you have these really, like, there's um, there's uh, Jerry, the father, who's uh, voiced by Chris Parnell, who is one of the best straight men in comedy, right. I, and, I would say. And you can't like, have a cartoon without him at this yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, right? No kidding. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, you have uh, Beth, the you know Rick's daughter, Morty's mother, uh, voiced by Sarah Chalk, also known as Second Becky from Roseanne, okay, or uh, <laughs> uh, Elliot from Scrubs, okay. And they're they're like always about to divorce, and then something always brings them back in, okay. And it's like it's sort of like talks about like the tenacity of love, how it's like it it isn't giving up, even though yeah. logistically or logically it should, yeah. Uh, And so that's interesting to see. But it's also interesting to see how sort of like Rick, who acts almost as a god in this world because he's the smartest man in the world and can just screw with anybody he wants. Yeah. But like the wake that he has on the people around him. And like that's that's a, a central theme. Yeah. Is that Rick's actions have massive repercussions. And you have to like realize that there, you know, you know, I mean, Newton's laws. Like with actions, you need reactions. And so, where does that come from? Like you don't just do what you want and leave everything untouched. Right. So this is really a comedy for all of the uh, existential dread and all of the nihilism, with like a lot of heart and a lot of humanity. Yes, and it's also at the same time a very intellectual comedy with fart jokes in it. Nice. Which is like. So, so the show is basically it is intellectual with a a a pinch of fart. Yeah. It is nihilism with a pinch of heart. Is that what draws you to it ultimately? I think the fact that when I'm done every episode, I'm like that was another perfect. Like it's almost jealousy. Yeah, because I'm like another perfect episode. God damn it! Like, <laughs> how do you keep? It's like read. It's like you know what? A good example is like The Onion. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen The Onion do something that wasn't funny. Yeah. Like, they nail it every single time. And, like, Rick and Morty has that sort of a thing where I'm just like, ah. Like, I'm, it's it's impressive. Like, aside from the fact that when I watch every episode, which, by the way, that 
like Rick and Morty is on in the background when I'm doing things. Okay. Like it's just So it's drilling into your psyche. It at is this literally point. just I, I I loop the two seasons on Hulu and then I probably illegally YouTube stream season three <laughs> episode one. Uh, uh, so it it's boring down into your psyche. Do you feel like it is now, you're saying that it is more an obsession of jealousy, of perfection, of intellectual. But what, as you're describing things, you get passionate about the humanity of it's, it. It's only part of it. like, And that's, I think, the thing about the layers of Rick and Morty is with Rick and Morty, like, it's something that you can just enjoy at face value. And then you watch it again and you enjoy it at face value and then you start noticing more. And okay. then you watch it again and then you see it. And then by the time you're done... There are five different like levels that you didn't even realize okay. were going on. You're like, you're like, how deep does this go? Yeah, and like it, that to me, like anytime you can watch something over and over and over again and notice new things. Yeah, like that. That to me, like, is there a better value than something that gives you a new experience over and over and over? Right. Again? So this goes back to like that commitment idea. Like this is worth an obsession. It because is. Because I'm going to get a lot out of it. It is, and it, but it's an interesting obsession because all my other obsessions, I'm very financially invested. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, like like we both showed up in Star Wars shirts yeah. talking about. Our Star Wars shirts, collecting and where our we action got them, figures, and our action yeah. figures, and going to the depth. Uh, with Rick and Morty, like I feel like I can exist outside of the consumption area of that. Like I don't. Okay, need so you're not the- feeling driven to be like I need to get my Rick wig. Exactly. Or I, to yeah, express this. Or exactly. Like I I need. Uh, for like a good example of that is like there have been Rick and Morty comics for a while, and yeah. I didn't really chase them down. I I picked up a trade paperback recently just to sort of. If I'm going on a podcast about Rick and Morty, I should be at least a little bit aware yeah. of, of the parts of it. But, like, I don't need the Funko Pops. I don't need to wear the Rick and Morty shirts. Like, uh, yeah. like I'm not, for some reason, I don't feel as obligated yeah. um, to is do that. It because it's a show about existentialism or sort of like, what's the point? This Funko Pop's just going to rot. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, <laughs> well, the irony is that the Funko Pop oh, would be the only, only thing, thing in my apartment that wouldn't rot. <laughs> True. <laughs> you learned better science than I have uh, by but watching Rick and Morty. But yeah, but I mean, when you when you, I don't know why I'm not. I, a lot of it, I think, because a lot of the shirts that are like, like like for example, t-shirts. Like I don't wear jokes on shirts. Yeah. Really, it's very rare that I buy like a funny shirt. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm a comedian. Like I'll do. You leave it to me. I'll do the comedy. <laughs> So, like, with a lot of the Rick and Morty merchandise is sort of, like, joke-themed or whatever. And I'm like, I don't feel that sort of ingrained need that I do to uh, need Daredevil on my chest or something like that. I don't know why. Like, I, it is strange. Or maybe because it's still so fresh to me. Yeah. Like, it's weird. I feel like uh, with something that's been around for a long time, like Star Wars or superheroes, you can sort of use a T-shirt or an action figure to pull out the part of this massive thing that has risen to mean something to you. It's like your little horcrux. Yeah, your little horcrux of like, and I do that. Like, my t-shirts are only big symbols. I don't like big, messy panoramas of pictures. Oh, I yeah. like nice, iconic things. Mm-hmm. So for me, like, that's a way for me to curate yeah. how I feel about this thing. Look what I like. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I wonder if, like, something Rick and Morty hasn't been around quite long enough where the the level of merchandising that's available can't quite be curated. Yeah, I'm I'm I don't know. You know what I do have is I have a little um I, did you see the the Me Seeks? No. Episode. It's really fantastic. And that's it's the perfect example of existentialism where Rick has this box that creates these little guys that they well they're not little but they're like hum, you know humanoid and okay. they're like hey like and they only have once they do is they have one job and then as soon as they complete that task they disappear. Like, that's it. Yeah. And so they show up and, um, you know, it's like, oh, like, you know, open this jar. Here you go. Bye. And then they die. And that's it. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. But Jerry, the father, wants to take uh, two strokes off his golf swing. Okay. And they're like, can do. And then they can't do it. He's like, like, and he just basically abandons it. And they're stuck there. And, they're, and the whole thing is like them being like, existence is pain. And like they keep making more me seeks to try to help. And it creates this big melee. And then they finally realize, oh, we got to kill him. And that's how they'll take all the strokes off his game. And yeah. so it's this idea that these these 
these creatures that they have one goal and once then they can die. So existence is, is a few seconds or, or an hour or yeah. something like that. And then they're done. Whereas a couple days is basically eternity and it's okay. hell for them. <laughs> and that's really great. They that want to die to you. We're like, I need some merch of that. Well, there's such, a, but it's, they're probably the most iconic okay. um, side characters of the show. Um, and so I was at, I was at a VRLA, a virtual reality expo. Um, a couple weekends uh, ago, and I they had a little a little me seeks okay. as, dressed like a caddy for the golf swing, yeah. and and I bought that for my my girlfriend because uh, we both are like All we about both the are Mises. obsessed. Well, we're both <laughs> obsessed with Rick and Morty. Like nice. we we watch it together. It's a it's a cute little thing, and it's funny at the VRLA Expo, I was demonstrating like this program where you can make like almost like cartoons and then live them, like be inside oh, of yeah, them. Oh, yeah, 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 nice. Uh, through this company called Mindshow. And the one that I interacted with was actually done by Justin Roiland. Okay. Because there were like three different ones done by different like comedy personalities. Yeah. And, and they were they were like, that one's Justin Roiland. I'm like, I'm going to do that one. <laughs> I'm in there. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. get into Jeff a fight Seats. on a plane wing. <laughs> okay. Well, since you brought up the uh, existential themes a lot, I wanted to ask you just some questions kind of diving off of Rick and Morty. Since the show does deal with alternate dimensions, have you ever thought about what different versions of you might be doing in alternate dimensions? Oh, yeah. I think that's I, I think the idea of I forget who it was. There's a philosopher that, that says this idea, and I, I've never forgotten about this, but like that basically hell is you meeting the best version of you possible <laughs> right? And to show what you could have done had you applied. And I always think about that. And that's actually one of the influences of why I retired from teaching at 30 is because I kind of like, I hate using the reference because it's super dated, but I kind of woke up out of the matrix a little bit. Okay. And I realized I was like, oh my God, I sacrificed my 20s to this thing that just because I was good at it, I was right. like, you know, it was an easy, like I breezed through teaching. Like, right. It was so there's just, a little bit of that sort of uh, what makes me seeks funny of like, I found a thing that I can do, yeah. so I shall do it. Yes. And I did that. And I, you know, I just turned 22 when I started teaching and I, I just was like, this is my life now. Yeah. But I always wonder what would have happened if I had um, started comedy earlier. earlier. Yeah. Because I didn't start comedy until 30. But you're very driven now. Uh, yeah. From talking to you, like I, I see you around town. I know you are busy, and I know you are very proactive. You are not somebody who's like just sitting around waiting for the world to come to you because you sent out some headshots and some tapes. You are proactive. Try so, to be. does that make you feel sometimes now that like there's probably a more loser Jeff May in a different dimension because oh, they're not sure. working as hard as me? I think I think there there are there are certain points that you can sort of trace as to like the 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 main points of your life. Yeah. Like if you look at a timeline of your life, there are five things that happened to you that really changed how you are and what would have happened if there was a divergent moment. Yeah. Like when I was 19 years old, what if I decided not to start boxing and stayed, you know, obese and and like where would my life be in that yeah. direction? Or what if um I had stayed married instead of deciding to get a divorce. Okay. Uh, or like, what if I continued teaching? Yeah. Or what if, you know, and so like there are these, you know, because in the course of a year, I got divorced, retired from teaching and moved to L.A. from Boston. Okay. So like those three things That's that happened lot. in succession, but like any one of those things could have changed where like I could have stayed married, retired from teaching and stayed in Boston. So, uh, you know, I could have been like, trying comedy while being kind of like kept or whatever which <laughs> could have happened to yeah. be fair like i was not the breadwinner in my marriage okay fair enough um so if i revealed to you though like that i was a wizard right now and just like hey i'm gonna open a portal here yeah. in my apartment and you can look in on your other life would you be like yes i'm so curious or would you be like no it disturbs me to think about having to see what the other options are i think i'm curious okay like there's i think I think if the me that didn't retire, if you asked him, yeah, he would be like, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine in my... Well, because yeah. I was a teaching in my hometown. Yeah. Like, it was like... And it's a small, small town. So, like, I was... In, near Boston? Or? About about, a, about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Boston. Okay, so like, you were seeding a stereotypical, like, Ben Affleck film. Yeah, I might as... Well, not even a Ben Affleck film. More like a John Mellencamp song. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, like, <laughs> I, like small town, like that. Yeah. Like, I, like, literally, like, population 12,000. The school was built on my grandfather's old property. 
Oh, like okay. that's how towny I was. Yeah. And I was very much like, well, this is my life. I'm gonna I was born in Charlton. I'm gonna die in Charlton. And then after I realized I'm like, what what am I gonna do? I'm gonna die and I'm gonna wonder <laughs> what happened. So like in that regard, I think I already did get that look. Okay. You know, like yeah. when I was 30 and I had that sort of like hopefully not midlife crisis if it was 30. <laughs> but like at that point in time, I sort of woke up and I said, I know what the other me is going to be like. And he's going to be just base level until yeah. until death. And I'll live that very American antiseptic life. Yeah. Of like, I, I literally had the house with the white picket fence. OK. Like I had that. So this is a little bit of like um, a little bit of that sort of Morty perspective of. Morty kind of wants, you know, I mean, I've watched the first episode. Yeah. Morty is like, I, he isn't sure if he wants the adventure. Yeah. And then he does get all of the the glory and the terror yeah. of these adventures. The pilot for Rick and Morty is very interesting. I don't consider it canon. Okay. Uh, it's Well, there's a reason. I There are certain things. There are certain things that happen in that that don't necessarily thread okay. for the remainder. Like they're like at one point in time they're in what essentially is a intergalactic airport. Okay. And what you find out over the course of the show is that Rick is one of the universe's most wanted terrorists because of how he views uh, you know bureaucracy and blah 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 and yeah. all that. So like there's part of this thing where it's like well you wouldn't be that part doesn't make sense. But okay. The pilot is just what they needed to do to sell the show. Yeah. Really. Um, so I kind of, is that weird that I, I, that no, I no. personally am saying, I don't think it's canon. No, not at all. Um, I, I delight in that. It's one of the most <laughs> obsessive nerdy things that have been said on the podcast. <laughs> I don't personally accept the pilot is canon. No, I totally understand what you mean. Um, so I, another episode I've watched Rick and Morty, uh, I am 99% sure I'm remembering this correctly, but feel free to correct me. Uh, they're freezing of time, right? Yes, where they stop things so then they can go take care of other yes. stuff. That is the season one finale. Okay, so the season one finale. Uh, in the, so it's the party episode that I, I believe is yeah. the one you saw where they travel around and that's where you meet Bird Person, who is voiced by Dan Harmon. <laughs> uh, Bird Person. <laughs> um, and yeah, they do. But it's funny because when they do that, like they they have to maintain the universe. Yeah, as time is frozen. Because the way they control time, it's not like every other trope where, you know, you put your fingers together, time is frozen, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So they have to, like, clean their parents or else the mold will, like, yeah. cause an infection because, like, the weather isn't frozen. So, like, they they froze it on a, human di- on a humid day. Okay. So as they're walking up to the door, when you see it in season two, they're, like, cleaning and, like, their parents <laughs> and, like, washing them to make sure they don't get moldy. Yeah. Like, that's great. That's, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So... It's always has an uh, an element of responsibility to it. So if you could freeze time the way they do in Rick and Morty, where you were still had to have some level of responsibility, but you could still go do stuff. Have you ever thought about what you would do if you could freeze time? Uh, do you want to hear the most meathead uh, answer I could possibly give you? <laughs> sure. Uh, that would be my gym time. Oh, really? That would be my trip to the gym. Okay. Does that seem almost too... Uh, in my own world centrist like I don't want to like sneak into the Louvre or anything like that no. but like honestly like if I had access to that like if I could buy myself an extra hour outside like in a pocket outside yeah. of time I would just use that as my gym time and then be able to live my life no I think that's great because I can tell from your eyes that that was an honest immediate answer <laughs> that you weren't like fishing for do I got something funny so I, I love that and also I feel like that's the most uh, delightful thing to hear about exercise because a lot of us like myself who don't exercise enough yeah. Go like, oh, but it's because it's time. It's, it's It takes up the time. So it's it's nice to it, uh, see somebody who is actually in shape go, yeah, time is a part of it. Well, it's funny, too, because, like, I'm in shape, but I'm also a sugar addict. Okay. So, like, I have this veneer of being in shape, but I have, like, this little tummy that I can't get rid of <laughs> ah. because I just, like, and my, my to be fair, my girlfriend eats, like, crap. And she, okay. she's physically uh she she just doesn't get she doesn't gain weight she's okay. a, an anomaly so she eats like a pint of ice cream a day <laughs> and i'm and i literally have to talk to her and be like i'm not you like i had a problem with this my yeah. entire life i can't i can't ice cream with do you that. baby so i ha- and she's like oh, i don't get to go to the gym i'm like you don't need to go to the gym <laughs> like, i need to go to the gym i need to freeze time yeah, yeah I, but yeah like I, I mean i think an hour and if i i'm no, I won't be greedy. Just take that hour. Yeah. That I go there and and uh, I mean, think about what that would do. Like how that would change. You could you could 
sculpt yourself physically to the way you want outside of time. Yeah. But you're not, but you're doing it in a way that you earn it. I'm very big on earning what you get. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I grew up on a farm. So there's a very like a kind of like a, an implied. Yeah. Work like, is like a, good. You yeah. should work for the things like, you have. Like I didn't grow up like like here's the thing I grew up on a like an old dairy farm that was no longer working okay but I still had like like stacking wood and like those sorts of things but I had like a farmer's diet and Nintendo okay which is probably why <laughs> I ended up sort of making the shift the way I did so you uh, were physically. fed to work in the fields and then you played Metroid exactly a <laughs> lot of Metroid a lot of, a lot of Metroid uh, uh, I had one other Rick and Morty specific question um, I think what a lot of people probably know is just this sort of surface level humor it's great humor but the burping shtick of Rick yeah that he burps mid speech yeah uh, do you want to do it oh you mean like where he's talking like this and he <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's fine, Morty. It's fine. It's just things are what they are. Yeah, like that. Uh, yeah, you know what's funny about that is that actually destroyed Justin Roiland's throat. Oh, really? When he did the first episode, yeah, because he would keep drinking, uh, you know, whatever, like a Lacroix or, or okay. a soda or whatever, until like he induce... wasn't finding an actory way to do it. He was just well, yeah, doing that to his they, throat. They're they they were legitimate burps yeah. in there and so he's like yeah he's like it really wrecked my throat <laughs> um but yeah because well he the thing is about rick is he self-medicates with alcohol yeah and in that episode you were talking about the time freezing one uh bird person explains he's like you know when he says wubba lubba dub dub that means i'm in great pain you know <laughs> and that and that he stays drunk all the time because it's it's numbing to all of the pain yeah that he has to experience so when you hear the burps you are reminded of the numbing pain yeah, I mean that's it's great. It, it, it's that, uh, yeah, like that's interesting. It's it's a weird. It took me a while to sort of get used to it. At first, I found it kind of annoying. Yeah, because I was it, like, mm. I think there's some surface level parts of Rick and Morty where it could look like, hey, it's another cartoon that's kind of adult that's uh, kind of saying you know really edgy things. And like, obviously, there's so much more intelligence and yeah. heart to it. And it's not Ren uh, and Stimpy. No, it's not. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, since I think the burping does ultimately really work for all the reasons that you said, do you think that there is other TV shows that would be made better if one of the characters was constantly burping? I'd have to think about it. I, I uh, That would make it really fun. Imagine having that happen. And you know what? I feel like there was probably one of the... I was going to be like, wouldn't it be funny if someone in The Sopranos... But The Sopranos <laughs> seems like a show that, <laughs> that would have had happen. some obscure guy be like, hey, what? That guy over here keeps burping over here. Like... <laughs> You know, like yeah. that's the kind of show where I would have been like, imagine taking something so serious, and then I was like, oh, they did that. Yeah. Or like somebody in Breaking Bad, and I'm like, oh yeah, they would have yeah, done Breaking that. Breaking Bad would like, do that. Yeah. Lavelle Crawford in Saul's office would. So have I think done that. that's ultimately what you're saying is like a show only deserves burping if it is of the highest quality. Yeah, it's got. Well, I mean, it's but it's true. I mean, you know, when you look at when you look at shows like not to go on a tangent, but Breaking Bad, like they have. They're the comedy and the tragedy is yeah. the the whole the whole Saul office. I mean, that's, yeah. they're all comedians for a reason that yeah. are in that office. And it's all earned stuff. Yeah. That's great. But that's I, great. yeah, I'm, now I'm thinking, I'm like, mm, I don't know. I would have loved to see old Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. <laughs> just talking about people getting murdered. That's great. Just letting them go every He's once in a while. so straightforward. And then on the evening of dinner, excuse me. Hey guys, this is Sarah Meyer, co-producer of this show, and I'm hanging out on Main Street in Santa Monica, stopping people to see if they've heard of Rick and Morty. I'm going to guess nobody has. This is Santa Monica. This is posh nonsense. Nobody's going to watch TV here. They just surf all day. Have you ever seen the show Rick and Morty? I have not. Have you heard of it? I have not. No. No. Can you guess what it is based on the name Rick and Morty? Um, a comedy? Yeah. Yeah. A dog and a cat. Two best friends. Have you ever seen the show Rick and Morty? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Like it. Love, it. Love it. Yes. Uh, I think it's hilarious, smart, unexpected, sarcastic humor, heavy strand of nihilism. Do you binge watch it? Definitely. And I binge watched it. The show me what you got one, I think I've seen it a thousand times. Show me what you got. <laughs> I like what you got. Good job. <laughs> if you could travel to a different dimension, where would you go? Oh, that's a tough question. Let's go to Mars. Why not? Say the aliens. Um, it's actually, it's a parody of Back to the Future. Do you, uh, see, do you like Back to the Future? I, yeah, I like Back to the Future. Would you time travel if you could? Sure. Where would you go? Last weekend. <laughs> Kill that hangover. <laughs> Cinco de Mayo. 
Is LA another dimension? Uh, definitely, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a, it's one of the hubs of the universe, for sure. If you had a message for the creators of Rick and Morty, what would you say to them? Um, please don't stop. <laughs> Rick burps a lot, right? Yeah. yeah, his mouth is bleaking. Yeah. Yeah. What other TV show would you think would benefit by more burping? Every show. <laughs> well, I can think of a show where I appreciate where the characters are gross. I think Broad City is awesome because there's gross girls in it. Lots of gross girls out there. Um, they burp a lot. Yeah. They poop a lot. Okay, well, let's hear your Rick impression. Marty, you're, 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 Marty, you're such an idiot. <laughs> Can't handle it, Marty. You're killing me. <laughs> We're going to move on to our How Obsessed Are You questions. All right. So I ask these kind of questions to everybody who's on the podcast. I like to see how different kinds of obsessions express themselves and how obsessed people really are. So do you think about Rick and Morty every day? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, because I pretty much, like, if we're killing time or, like, say, for example, like, if it's, like, my girlfriend's cooking dinner or something, I'll play Rick and Morty so she can hear it and I just have it on in the background or okay. whatever. Because uh, we follow traditional gender roles. No, um, <laughs> but, like, so it's usually, like, it is the screensaver for our life right. at and this it's point just, in time. You weren't joking when you say it's just kind of running on a loop. It is, yeah, yeah. It's it's just always like I just recently restarted the loop. Okay, so I'm back to uh, I think season one, episode three or four now. Okay, cool, cool. Would you write Rick and Morty slash fiction? Slash fiction? Yeah, I don't want to disrespect those characters like that. <laughs> but I bet Dan, I bet Dan and Justin would. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not. Well, they kind of a little bit did. There's one of the episodes where, uh, where the Morty's sister is a uh, like a. a sexual object in someone's fantasy that they fall into and she kind of gets all like a little creepy in it okay and oh, i think a, i saw that episode yeah, yeah. It's, it's the uh it's the one with scary terry the uh the freddy krueger <laughs> yes. knockoff yeah. yes so it seems redundant to you to write slash fiction because you feel yeah. like if the show runs long enough eventually they, they will would, do that to themselves. they might do something yeah i don't know if they, that's weird that because because the idea of 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 uh Jesus, uh, I mean, incestuous statutory rape. Like, yeah, that's a little bit. That's a little bit it's, rough. It's, it's like, hard to make funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if there was a group that could make it funny, it would be them. Yeah, like, and I guess I didn't mean Rick and Morty necessarily together. Oh, but any sort of sexuality within, like, would you oh. want to write a story about the parents? I would write the most boring slash fiction. I think. <laughs> like, I'm like as like a straight dude. Like, yeah. I have like. Here's the thing about like, like I recognize the science of of certain things, and like as like a like a just a very sort of like run of the mill, yeah, you know, child of the '80s man. Uh, I feel like I wouldn't be as adventurous with the fantasy that I would. I'd be like, oh, their boobs came out, yeah, bro. And then they high fives. It was awesome. <laughs> okay, so I will change this question when I ask it again to ask people: Would you write boring, straightforward slash fiction? Yeah, right. About your favorite. Television? And then they like they bone. Yeah, bro. <laughs> uh, but in general, uh, would you want to write for the show? Obviously, you are a comedian. You're in LA. You're working toward having thing opportunities like that, but you also kind of worship this show um i don't i wouldn't have a problem with that i don't necessarily believe in in like the idea that that things should be hero worshipped in okay. a way that you can't influence them yeah and i learned that very quickly coming in here when you know you know i was doing you know stand up you know, with people that I would like had exalted. And I was like, I, th I think I did better than them. <laughs> and like, yeah. once you get past that, like if, if you do a set better than somebody that you used to look up to, like, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the best comic or something like that, right. but like it's happened where people who, who I'm like, Oh, I love your special. And then it's like, even if like they were trying brand new stuff and I had perfectly polished material and that's why it happened. Yeah. It sort of snaps you out of that hero worship. So yeah. I, in a way, I don't think, I think I would, um, I don't think I would be, a, I would be like a punch up joke okay. writer and like, I'd be great in a writer's room, but if you told me to write the script, I don't think, but just, that's more just my, my indictment of my own ability to write okay. scripts. Okay. Like I'm really good at writing punch up jokes or like, you know, it'd be good here to do that. But like the structure of writing okay. a script to me, it's just so brutal. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so it seems like you have a realistic uh, relationship with that, which is great. When people walk into your home, can they immediately tell you like Rick and Morty? Yeah, the Meeseeks is right across the... Uh, <laughs> so when you open up... We have... Uh, my girlfriend and I have, like, a collection of all the stuff we get at, like, conventions together okay. and everything. So there's, like, this little, like, museum of our relationship on a shelf right yeah. in front of you when you walk in. So, like, you can tell that I like IG-88 and, <laughs> and that she loves Futurama. And then right on top of there is just a Meeseeks just sitting there hanging out. Is that out. just, like, where it, it ended up working out in your apartment? Or did you set it up to be a declaration to people who enter? No, people don't enter our apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a warning to stay away. It, it is. It's we, one of the things that we work really well on is that we're both cluttered but not gross. Okay. And it like fits where you're like, oh, we, I can have a stack of laundry over there, but we never leave like dishes out. Or yeah, that's like that. absolutely the way homes should be listed by realtors when they're yeah. selling them. This is cluttered but not gross. Yeah. Uh, if the only way to see the next season of Rick and Morty was to steal a copy from Walmart, would you steal it? I don't steal art. Okay. I actually make it a very specific thing to not do that. Like the only ever? Yeah. You couldn't mm. possibly see it. This is There's going to be a lot of rationalization in okay. there. Um, because are they getting revenue from it if yeah. I don't steal it? If not, no. I don't have a problem stealing with Walmart other than the fact that uh, they pers- prosecute to the full extent of the law, <laughs> as their signs <laughs> yes. say. Um, I, I, I have this very, very strange moral block on taking art yeah because primarily because like most of my friends are artists right. they're comic book writers and comic book artists and stuff so like i do have that feeling of like if i take this i'm stealing from somebody right. but i mean if if it's like in a safe at walmart for some reason <laughs> like walmart hq but like yeah see normally very... normally people just hear walmart and they're totally okay with theft uh and they might be answering in a joking way but let, let me give you a different scenario uh, in the spirit <laughs> of rick and morty Dan Harmon's not a difficult person to find. He does a weekly show, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's very open and and friendly. So you could walk up to Dan Harmon and say, "Hey, I need to steal this from Walmart, but here's thirty dollars for you and Justin. I now would, I'm going to go steal it from Walmart." I would do that. Okay, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, without a doubt. <laughs> There's no better way that that could have worked out. <laughs> Because yeah. not only am I giving the money to the people directly yeah. that they like, but I'm also taking something from the bad guys. This is a new, terribly illegal form of crowdfunding that I'm going to get started. That's fine. Where you just Let's go for physically it. track down the creators and give them money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Nothing dangerous or creepy about my idea. I nailed yeah. it. Uh, would you correct someone if you heard them say an incorrect Rick and Morty fact? Just out in the wild on the streets of Los Angeles. Yes, but it would take a second because I would have to slide in. I'd have to slide in and be like, oh, my God, like, you like Rick and Morty? I like Rick and Morty. But I wouldn't be like, "Uh, I hate. There's no worse person in the nerd world than I'm actually guy. Yes. I'm actually guy needs to be just shot in the face. Like, (laughs) Well, actually, no. uh, The guys that say fake nerd, those are the guys. Those are the worst. Directly under him are I'm um, actually yeah because um, you could have a fake nerd guy and then you could have somebody say I'm um, actually there's no such thing as a fake nerd then yeah. the I'm um, actually guy would kind of be okay but yes yeah. Yeah. yeah that's fair enough yeah uh, uh, so you would try to engage like hey we both like oh my this God, thing I like that by the way the me seeks episode yeah yeah I would I would sort of like I have I'm lucky that there there are skills I have and there are skills that I don't and I'm very aware of those I'm <laughs> hyper aware yeah. And and one of the skills I have is 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 conversation, or at least I, I think yeah. I have that where I can I'm very opening and inviting, even though I'm terrifying. <laughs> like I I try to have a, like a warm face, a smile, yeah. be very you know. So like I feel like I could go in there and be like, actually, you know what? I know that that's the way you you think it is, and I, I totally uh, get why. But you know, it's actually <laughs> like if you think about it, 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 it in this okay. regard, yeah. So you would really, you wouldn't, well, actually them, you would try to gently butt them. You, yeah, you Oreo them a little bit. You know, yeah. Like, you know, nice, truth, nice. Like, <laughs> it's a teacher, that's a teacher trick too. Okay, yeah. The, the way Oreo. you said Oreo, yeah, so that's a, was that taught to you as a part of your education or was that something that another <sighs> teacher passed on to you, some wisdom in the break room? I think it was probably in a class at some point okay. in time, yeah, because I did take the standard education classes. Okay. They, they, you know, there's a lot of stuff, especially dealing with like inclusion classrooms and people with autism, uh, okay. which in the nerd world, you're going to bump into some. Yeah, people are on the spectrum, so like yeah. how to how to address that appropriately and to not ruin somebody's day. 
Right. Because you need to be right. Like, that's a big deal. So what's on the outside of the Oreo? The the stuffing is, so the, you, tr- is the truth. The stuffing is the truth. And then the, the cookies are, like, the compliments or the the softening, like... Okay. Like, oh, my God, that's an excellent way you put that. Uh, you However. know, I heard you say that. <laughs> that. Uh, but beyond that, I really love the insight that you gave to that. That's yeah. fantastic. And then a conversational version of that. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so you would Oreo someone who said something incorrect about Rick and Morty. That's great. Uh, if you owned a sports team, would you name them after a Rick and Morty character? Like the Meeseeks? Yeah. Yeah, I probably would. <laughs> if, I, wait, if I did, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it would be a lot easier to get those rights than it would be to have Disney fork over. The Boba Fett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Mandalorians <laughs> the or something IG-8s, like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> the assassin droids. The assassin droids. Yeah. Would you dress up as a Rick and Morty character at San Diego Comic-Con? San Diego? Yeah. I wouldn't dress up as anything at San Diego. Yeah. San Diego is a zoo. Yeah. You it's know, very, very hot. It's, it's aggressive. Like, it is. Um, the thing about cosplay like I've been around it a lot yeah. and it's great. I love that people do it and everything. That's fantastic. But like, number one, you're in the way. If you're cosplaying and you're stopping all the time to take pictures, you are totally in the way. Yeah. I, I respect what you do. I am in awe of your ability you're to sew the and heart and the spirit of the event, but also but get, physically you get are Get the, in the fuck way. out of my yeah. way. Yeah. Like that's like, it's like, Hey, like, Oh great. A Mortal Kombat character. Get, get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. Cause, but I, I mean, if I were, like, I have my list of, like, if I were to ever cosplay. Okay. So you have here's this who I would down. do. And I don't, I can't think of a Rick and Morty. Well, I, I would probably pick some obscure. There's yeah. an ep- there's a Parasite episode that's just filled with, like, where's Waldo-ish level of obscure characters. Okay. I'd probably try to pick one of those. I like going, I like going three steps away from the standard yeah so you, know. you don't want to just wander around with a rick wig you yeah. want to do, do something that's uh interesting and personal yeah that's like cool. hammer eye or or <laughs> amish uh amish cyborg or something yeah. like that yeah so i'm almost done with the how obsessed are you questions but i want to ask you a more general question because sure. you had brought it up earlier part of the reason i asked the how obsessed are you questions is to figure out how people express their interests uh and since you're not super drawn to expressing them through just capitalism like we yeah. discussed what do you think is the primary way that you express your obsession with Rick and Morty. Uh, I tell people to watch it. Okay. I ask. I'll, I'll like straight up ask people. Like, I I really like interpersonal relationships. Like, I like talking to people. Yeah. I, like, I'm fascinated by it. Like, it's one of my favorite things to do is to like hear your background story. Yeah. And so if somebody, if you, if like say if I was talking to you, and I immediately saw that you were wearing a Star Wars shirt, I'm wearing a Star Wars shirt. Bam. Oh my God! What are the odds? <laughs> Realistically, one in three uh, that two people wearing Star Wars shirts would see each other, um, and then we'd be talking. Blah, blah blah. Oh my God! I like this, and we'd be talking about. Oh, did you read Thrawn? And did you blah blah blah? Follow up to that would be like, Have you watched Rick and Morty yet? Okay. Like, are you a fan of that? Like, you have to see it. Like, okay. Like that's got to be right on your the top of your list of things you have to see. Okay, so you have made yourself a sort of a human pamphlet for Rick and Morty, where you bring yeah, it up in a friendly that's way. That's a really good way of putting it. Yeah, but I also, but I, it's so weird. There is that side because of like how I look. I always feel like people think I'm making fun of them a little bit. Okay, because I'm like smiling, but I look like yeah. a, an asshole. I look. Now, is this something you feel, or do you feel like you've gotten feedback from people Both. in Los Angeles that Both. like? It's both. Okay. Yeah. How does somebody say, I understand you're trying to be friendly, but I'm frightened of you? Comics. <laughs> like, I mean, how many comics? I Most of the okay. people I know are comedians. Okay. And comedians generally speak their mind. Yeah. Uh, to, and so, like, a lot of people, when, you know, like, they'll be wearing, like, a you know Black Panther shirt or something. I'll be like, oh, my God. Like, the superhero, not the, right. the, the, the social group from the 70s. <laughs> Uh, I'm super into the Black Panther social too. group. Yeah, uh, but I'd be like, oh my god, it's Black Panther, club. right? That's a you know, oh, Fantastic Four, and I love the Jack Kirby, blah yeah. blah. blah. And the people like they kind of be like, oh, I wasn't expecting that at all. You seem like a dick at first, and I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like that's why I softened you up. Okay. Like, like, so what you're saying is the comedians in Los Angeles need to learn the Oreo technique. Comedians where they could say thank you for the compliment on my T-shirt. You kind of scared me a little bit, but I'm glad we had this interaction. There, yeah, like. Oh, look at that. How, how, how sweet is that? I get that a lot. I do like, 
I, I, uh, I think I made the joke. I said going teaching for ten, a decade was a really good way to get into comedy because I'm used to people that don't want to make eye contact and are generally intimidated by me. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, just a couple more How Obsessed Are You questions. Let's do it. If a bear was blocking you from watching Rick and Morty, would you try to get around the bear? Like a, like a husky gay gentleman? No, no, no. Like an actual bear. Uh, um, polar, Kodiak, Grizzly, you know, Black. We haven't talked about polar, and I like the absurdity of that. There is a polar bear in your home. You come home, you're going to try to watch Rick and Morty, but there's a polar bear blocking nah. your way. They've had it rough. <laughs> <laughs> they, you take the apartment. You know what? You've earned it. You've. <laughs> you, I mean, it's one of the last eight at yeah. this point. <laughs> you know, okay, like, so the, you would respect the polar I bear's feel bad rarity the, on Earth. Yeah, the polar bear is the homeless guy of the bear community okay. at this point in time. <laughs> like, you got to pity them and give them some yeah. money when you see them because we are fucking them up like, yeah. big time. Okay, so you just say, you enjoy Rick and yeah. Morty. I will walk away. If it was a black bear, I think I could... Okay. I think I'd do all right against How about if it was a ninja? How about if it was somebody trying to do physical harm? Would you risk physical yeah. harm to get to Rick and Morty? Weapons or just skill? Skill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally oh, yeah. would. <laughs> I got the weight on him. Okay. Yeah. You know, I fought for 11 years. Yeah. So I'm like, I can, I can, I can handle it. Yeah. You know, you... A little Japanese guy coming at me, I'll just throw him against the wall. <laughs> if it's all skill, yeah. I mean, do you ever see the Sin City? Oh yeah. You ever see them? Okay, you know when uh, when Marv uh, handcuffs himself to Kevin. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, let's see you get away now. Like I would just do some shit like that. Like that, okay. that's a perfect example of that. You would invest would, in the spirit of so, Frank Miller. So if Elijah would... No. <laughs> let's get something real straight right now. No. I'm not investing in the spirit of Frank Miller. But yeah. So if Elijah Wood's trying to prevent me from watching uh, with his ninja moves. And okay. I would, I'm going to change the question to that for sure. If Elijah Wood has ninja moves. If Elijah Wood has sharp nails and tennis <laughs> shoes. Here's the final How Obsessed Are You question. If you could not watch Rick and Morty without you or someone you care about first being punched in the crotch, would you still watch Rick and Morty? Yeah. i take it. Yeah. yeah. So is that coming from a place of experience where uh, were you punched in the crotch a lot in your boxing days? <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> Wouldn't that be brutal? Yeah, it's, it's dick fighting. It's a thing we do. Um, no, but like the, that pain, it goes away eventually. Yeah. Like, well, who actually also wait real quick. Yeah. Defining characteristic. Uh, how about, who's punching me? Uh, in the let's crotch? go with Elijah Wood. Right. Right. Not. Oh, yeah. Actual actor Elijah I, Wood. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he was like, that. it'll hurt a little bit. Uh, Rick and Morty is about existential pain and dread anyway. Like, I can take pain. Like, pain's, it literally is not okay. a problem for me. So, like, I'll do that. Like, it sucks. Like, pain sucks. But once you get over the idea, the fear of getting hurt, you're just yeah. like, it just fucking sucks. Like, it sucks. You write it out. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been, I've been punched a lot. <laughs> yeah. Been, so, like, another, another 12 to 13 times a year. Yeah. It's fine. You get, maybe not on loop. You wouldn't watch it on a loop. Oh, yeah. I thought that was just my entry fee to watch new episodes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. That's then cool I can, to say Elijah then, Wood is in your home on a loop. <laughs> every 22 minutes, just getting <laughs> my dick turned to pudding by North. I yeah, I'm not that, that like, I'm not that cruel. I ask people to make a noise to sum up their obsession. Can you make a noise to sum up your obsession with Rick and Morty? Ooh-wee! <laughs> is that a general uh, emotional response, or is that from the show? It's me, Six. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, or like, wubba dub dub dub! Now, what is that? Who is that? That's uh, Rick's catchphrase. Okay. One of his catchphrases. Okay. Nice. So, which one feels more true to you? The Me Seeks? Because that's the one that came out first. Yeah, because he's very, like, excited and, like, he's like, I am enthusiastic about this. Yeah. And that, you know, that to me is. Yeah. yeah he's, he's just, like, really. I mean, the, the me, like, the Me Seeks episode is just so goddamn it good. It clearly like, speaks to you. It is. I think it's probably widely considered one of the best yeah. uh, episodes. And but here's the other thing about this show is like every time I see an episode, I'm like, this is one of the best episodes. They did. <laughs> There's like maybe two episodes that I've seen where I'm just like, ah, eh, this one was only very good. Yeah. Like it's that. Like every episode I see is always like, God damn it, it's so good. Yeah. So I'm enthusiastic about it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I rate people's obsession on a scale of one to seven, one being the lowest, seven being the highest. And then just for flavor, we'll say uh, seven me seeks. I think out of seven me seeks, I'm going to say you're like 4.5 me seeks yeah. obsessed, which is maybe a little bit lower than yeah. I was thinking. But I think there's something to me about 
fascinated with obsession because obsession is different than liking something. Mm-hmm. Obsession to me means you're you're dancing with the darkness a little bit. You're living with it a little bit. That you're bit, maybe... Yeah. I, I don't it, have the financial ability to commit as much as I probably would normally yeah. too. Yeah. And you're also just clearly a very analytical person. So you have mm-hmm. it... I'm so fascinated that you have it figured out of where it fits in your current pantheon of obsession. Yeah, it's, it's almost like obsession, but like as a detective trying to figure out a crime, like there's a lot of yarn on my wall yeah. pointing to like different things of like how these things connect. Yeah. I mean, the, cause like the, the themes, like the philosophical themes on Rick and Morty are just so insane. Plus, so you have philosophy mixed with science mixed with, you know, so it's like it's covering the humanities while also covering, you know, the sciences while also covering humor in such a brilliant way. Yeah. Ah, God damn it. It's so good. <laughs> God damn it. It's so good. God damn it. Uh, so do you want to plug yourself? Any, uh, any shows you got coming up? Uh, this episode will come out a little bit later after recording it. Yeah. Uh, but then also where can people find you on social media? Any of that kind of stuff? Sure, sure. Uh, on social media, uh, my Twitter and, uh, and Instagram or whatever, it's uh, Hey There Jeffro. Okay. That's my uh, H-E-Y-T-H-E-R-E-J-E-F-F-R-O. My friend's drunk stepdad used to scream that at me whenever <laughs> I walked in. And then all my friends took over. <laughs> So whenever I would do that, it was, uh, hey there, Jeff Rowe. But I'm Jeff May. Uh, you can find me. I'm pretty easy Jeff to find. Jeff May is yeah. Googleable. Yeah. It's very Googleable. Yeah. yeah. Seven letters. Uh, nice and easy. I run a, I run a monthly stand-up show called Mint on Card. Uh, I was lucky enough to have you on That's at a one ton of point fun. in time. Uh, and uh, it's the second Friday of every month. It's in a collectible toy store oh, that is open for business during the show. Uh, it's a really unique comedy experience. We get... I mean, we get the best comics in L.A. to do yeah, it. You people really people. want to do it now, and, and that's what we've done. We've tried to do the most um, pro-comedian, like, you know, we we pay, you yeah. know, we, we do tape, we do all these things where I want people to be like, that's the show I want to do. So we got that, and yeah. that's really, after a little over a year, we, we, we sort of have gotten that, which yeah. I'm really excited about. Second Friday of every month okay. at a store called Blast from the Past uh, on Magnolia and Burbank. We get a food truck. It's free. It's a, we do raffles. Yeah. We always get like random like weird shit. And then we're just like, <laughs> like here's a Doctor Strange poster signed by the entire art team. Like, Oh, like, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I just went to the movies and they were just there signing posters yeah, yeah. on opening day. So I was just like, all right, I'll take two of those. <laughs> Give me those. Uh, I got we, a comedy show. We also have a special edition. Um of Mint on Card on, on May 27th. We're, this is our first uh, sort of side quest oh, okay. of Mint on Card. We're doing it at um, Strategicon in Los Angeles, which is a gaming convention. Uh, and you are booked on that. Yay! Yeah, I've so yeah, that. come oh. come see Mint on Card in all of its places. Uh, Jeff runs a really great show. Yeah. Here are some uh, quick plugs for this show, and then we'll do our final questions. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram is at Joseph Scrimshaw. You can follow Obsessed Podcast on Twitter and Facebook as at Obsessed Podcast. For info on all my upcoming shows, like Strategicon and whatnot, you can check out my website at josephscrimshaw.com. You can find out about comedy albums and all my other stuff. You can also support Obsessed by backing us on Patreon for as little as one dollar a month you get access to our monthly patron only bonus episode for full info on that go to patreon.com slash joseph scrimshaw nice all right you ready for some final questions yes. i was also supposed to plug unpopular opinion oh well, go, go for it it's just the the podcast that i do it's pretty similar to what you got but unpopular opinion uh we we've been at it for four years oh a little wow. over now yeah we used to be at cracked and then we cracked away from them we, we went out on our own <laughs> okay and we do uh it's 10 episodes a week roughly and you can find us at unpops.com so what, what is the general concept it all depends on which episode because we have a lot of different hosts oh that nice, do different nice shows so like i i personally host anywhere from three to four episodes a week okay of the 10 along with adam todd brown who you've met yeah he did um Former writer and editor of Cracked and, and uh, Playboy and all these other play- excellent writer, great comedian. Um, so we we do uh, I do uh, like the Monday show, which is sort of like a uh, it's like a morning radio show okay. style. That's we do every Monday on uh, with uh, myself and actually my girlfriend Raquel, who's okay. super funny. Uh, Tuesdays I do a show called. Um, with them called uh, You People Are Insane, where we actually have our fans call in with questions. <laughs> Sometimes they're like, would you rather fight, you know, yeah. spider-sized bears or bear-sized spiders or something like I that. I love those questions. Yeah. And then, but, but also we get like crazy, um, like actual people looking for advice. And oh, so really? it's like this real interesting <laughs> dichotomy of like, 
from everywhere from the silly to the very serious. And is it whole general life or is it pop culture focused? Uh, it's general existence. A lot. Uh, it all depends. Uh, one of the one of the sections of of uh, the Monday show is called Jeff is a fucking nerd. Okay. Where I just talk about something big in the nerd world, like yeah. you know the X Men Gold problem, and like I'm talking about it. And at the end, they're just like, "You're a fucking nerd." I'm like, "I know," but it's a lot of fun. It's uh, we do one free weekly episode. We do a subscription service as well. Cool. We just shift it to Patreon as well. Oh, I, nice. I don't know how that how well that works, but I'm really excited about it. It's nice. Kind people give you money and you I, do things. Yeah, that's the way it should work. I I think it's weird to accept the idea of fans. Yeah, it's weird. Especially when, like, you come off of, like, being, you know, my old world where it was, you're more, like, at best stalked. Yeah. Uh, but to, to have fans. As a teacher? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you young you yeah. know, kids want to find you or whatever. But, like, here, like, like the fans are, they're amazing. And yeah. it's, like, crazy. Like, sometimes you say it out loud and you're like, I have a really weird life. Yeah. Like, I think it's great. I think it goes back to what you were saying kind of about not getting too in your own head about what fame is or like not not deifying yeah. art in yeah. artists to say like i'm a person i i am choosing to say hey i think i have something worth saying and all you're doing is you're a human and you are ag- agreeing with yeah. me that it's worth my time to say these things Agreed. because you enjoy them too yeah and it's yeah. getting away from that deification of like you were on my screen that lives in my home therefore you are above me i did a this is a weird thing and um i had a thanksgiving one year with like friends of friends and where it there was at the thanksgiving was uh an x-man yeah uh, a, a jedi and uh a survivor of the walking dead okay like all at this thing and i was just like sitting here i'm just like Oh, they play make believe. Like yeah. it was just like one of those things, like super talented people, and it's yeah. like, oh, but it's just, it's just their art. Yeah. Like it, it's fine. Like I do something similar that they couldn't. Yeah. And that really, it really wakes you up. Like celebrity really starts to lose its luster when you kind of like peel the veneer off. Yeah. And you're and like, it, oh, it's all just people doing jobs. Yeah, and I think that's great to get to that point where you are respecting people for the talent and the art. And I think that's what's great about Patreon because people are saying, hey, I like what you do. And they appreciate the work you do. Yeah. And they like you as a person. Yeah. Like, how great is that? Well, (laughs) they wouldn't give you money. True. If they thought you were a dick, they wouldn't give you money. Yeah. So, like, every every dime of that is also connected to your personality. True. And your silky smooth radio voice. (laughs) I'm working on it. It's fantastic. I was listening to an episode not too long ago and I was like, oh man, like yeah. That's a good radio voice. I'm yeah, jealous I think, of it. I think because I did theater for years and projected, I didn't realize that, uh, that I had a half-assed decent voice because, you know, I was yelling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, That's so uh, some thoughts on Patreon, dear listeners, and thank you to the people who yeah. do support me here on Obsessed. But we are going to do our final questions now. Jeff, if you could run at super speed, but only if you were eating at the exact same time, what would you eat? Uh, hmm. Uh, probably breakfast burrito. Okay. <laughs> now, is that just because you like breakfast burritos? I, I eat a dozen eggs a day. Like, I really, really do. Yeah, I eat a dozen eggs a day. I love eggs. Yeah. And breakfast burritos are my, like, my favorite way to consume eggs. Okay. So, that would give you the protein to keep running. Yeah. The tortilla gives you some carbohydrates that you can use to burn off. Yeah. A little salsa for flavor. <laughs> it's smearing everywhere yes. as I'm running in some sonic speed. Like, the messiest the thing you can eat. The salsa is the lightning, for sure. <laughs> nice. If you could make everyone in the world say a word or phrase together out loud, what might it be? Jeff May. Because, <laughs> man, that would yeah, I would build my brand up big time. That would build your brand. It'd definitely <laughs> be an ego check. Imagine that, though, if everyone <laughs> says it. And then afterwards, like, why did we say that? Why did we? And then they Google it. Imagine that. You'd be the most Googled thing. Oh, yeah. Like, why did everyone in the world just say Jeff yeah. May? Because I don't have, like, the I don't have that jokery need to, like, pull a prank on everyone to make yeah. them say fart out loud. But, man, that would be a good bump. Yeah. And I'm sure that people have made this joke. And I don't mean this as a joke on your name. But if I just suddenly, if I didn't know you and I just suddenly was made to say Jeff May, I might feel like. There was more to the sentence. Yeah, Jeff May was. Jeff yeah. May, what's yeah. going on? That's every substitute teacher I've ever had. I'm, I'm sure. In the, it, it took me a while to get yeah. to that. So no, some of those it, kids are faster it, than me. Yeah. It does, well, no, it's just it does have like every time I had a substitute teacher, they were like Jeff May, or may not. 
I'm like, yeah, fuck face. I'm here. <laughs> no Oreo for you, motherfucker. When, you, when your last name is a word, yeah. your life is a nightmare of adolescence. Yeah. Like, adolescence is just just a real piece of shit. Right. Because people have to go for the easy joke. Yeah. The most obvious yeah, thing they could possibly But do. yeah, like, when you my last name is a permissive verb. So, like, like yeah, like, looking <laughs> up Jeff May, sometimes you get weird, like, news stories about just, like, Jeff May have to realize that the, he'll have to pull the plug. Oh, so like, you get a Google alert on that? No, I don't Google alert. Okay, myself. I can't. But uh, you know, you might show up soon uh, on like a, an article about that because I saw something today. I don't think it was a prank uh, or like an internet joke meme thing, but that sites are using algorithms to grab their photos. So there was a horrible headline about a doctor who'd done something awful. So it was like Doctor Who did who killed somebody. Uh, it's it like who? second Doctor Who killed somebody, and it was a picture of Patrick Troughton with his flute. <laughs> like Aww. second Doctor Who. Yeah, so Jeff May, you you might get a lot of uh, uh, hits. Yeah, wow. Oh, you that's get a lot of branding by having your photo on. Like there it is. Yeah, Jeff some May ser- kill some people. Yeah, Jeff may be released from prison soon <laughs> after all those sex crimes. <laughs> and a big picture of your comedy show. That'd be great. Uh, final question for everyone on the podcast is: What is happiness? Ha. <sighs> Happiness is being able to go to sleep at night and not worry. You know, like, yeah. so there's no anxiety. Like, like when you rest your head down on your pillow, like you're not like you're just like today was a good day. Like you're not rewinding the day to find errors. No. And you're not worrying about the next day. It's just you can. I, but how about how, what an anxiety based driven <laughs> answer that was. No. Being able to sleep. That's what happiness is. I can finally rest my head and just uh, be able to relax every once in a while. No, I loved it. That was a great answer because it was uh, very sincere and honest. But then it had that old like uh, fortune cookie joke where you basically said, be in the moment in bed. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah. Oh, it's a lovely oh, answer. Oh, fortune cookies. <laughs> a lovely answer. Thank you so much for doing the podcast. I this had a blast. This is great fantastic. Fun. This is great. That is our podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest shared some stories with the rest. Rate five stars if you're impressed. You know what happened more often than not is kids used to say Joan of Arc was burned as a stake. <laughs> I got that probably in my career. I had a nine-year teaching career, and it happened probably 20 times. Where kids would literally say that she was burned as a stake. <laughs> and that to me, like, I know it's like, oh, kids are stupid and everything yeah. like that. But that to me, I was always like, oh, they really don't get it. Yeah. And I ass- like, it's actually a bit of a wake up call that, that you're not relaying information to them enough. Yeah. But like every time I'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> They're just hearing sounds.